Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Ariel Verde to you, so the speaker. The speaker, Ariel, uh, is actually currently working in uh, Italy at the Pado Observatory, so there's my connection with him. Uh, but he's Brazilian, so he did both his master and PhD in Florianopolis, very nice uh, city, as we call it. Um, and with uh, uh, Roberto Cid Fernandez. Well, so he's an expert in stellar population modeling uh, uh, and all the things that uh, Gustavo Cusual uh, does. So he uh, he's a postdoc in Padova since 2020. He arrived in Italy the day before everything was closed, was shut down. So that must uh, not be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he's working on uh, jellyfish galaxies, mostly high redshift, but now uh, he has done um, some works on star formation in the tails, and this is what he's going to present. Thank you. <laughs> so I will talk to you a little bit about uh, star forming regions that we find in the tails of the jellyfish galaxies. And so I was preparing this uh, uh, talk and I was thinking about like how to introduce myself, like also because I didn't know that Jacopo could, uh, I didn't trust Jacopo to do like something <laughs> <job, laughs> he did. Uh, and then I realized that I'm not actually that new in this institute because all of my first offer publications were in collaboration with someone from this institute. So either Gustavo or Jacopo, or even both of them. So, uh, yeah, I'm not that new. Like, I've, <laughs> I've been collaborating with this institute for a while. Uh, the work that I will present here is part of the GASP project. The GASP is um, an ESO large program that observes over 100 galaxies to understand gas removal processes. Um, in galaxies in clusters and also in the less impressive environments. And the, the main uh, galaxies that we are interested in are the jellyfish galaxies. So are these galaxies that if you look at the each alpha maps, you can see that they, they have these long tails of uh, ionized gas in this case, but all, we can also see this in whether gas phases, and this is gas that is being removed from the galaxy. So what happens is you have the galaxy cluster and there that has this very hot gas in the intercluster medium, and the galaxy, unaware of what's going to happen, falls into the cluster, and as the gas, the cold gas of the galaxy is removed, you form these tails and to remove all the gas, and you're left with this, and this is a little bit abstractive, uh, especially if you're from a slightly different field. You know how astronomy is, even if you go to a talk for uh, by someone who does something slightly different, sometimes it's hard to understand. So to put very simply, what happens to the galaxy is this. <laughs> okay, so the galaxy is feeling this wind from the cluster. Now we can, Make the analogy that the drool of the dog is like the gas. <laughs> and uh, so we have these MUSE observations that uh, the original gas project is based on MUSE observations. And in these MUSE observations that people have extensively studied, uh, the Jacopo included, you can see that there is this, uh, this clumpy uh, structure in the H alpha emission in the ionized gas emission in general. And if you look at diagnostic diagrams, uh, you can see that this um, uh, in these clumps, the gas is ionized by star formation. So you see that there is star formation in these regions and also some uh, diffuse ionized gas uh, around these clumps. But if you look at things in the MUSE resolution, you cannot uh, resolve things so well. And so 
we decided to observe some of these galaxies, six in total. I'm just showing my four favorite. We observe these six objects with the Hubble Space Telescope. And with Hubble, we can see these very, very tiny structures uh, that in MUSE they were uh, all smushed together. And we can really resolve these uh, star forming clumps and also provide very cool desktop backgrounds for you. Um, we have these observations in five filters, including a narrow band H alpha. But they don't look like really jellyfish galaxies, no? I mean, these four. It's a clickbaity type uh, name, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, no. It, what I mean is that in, in the candles that we have seen from just before, okay. they have long tail. And yeah, yeah. This is because uh, when you have better resolution, you see that it's very tiny things, right? And if you follow these tiny things, you see the the structures. But if you, when you have the lower resolution, and this is maybe I have to go to the first slide to yeah. So if you look at the H alpha, like this, for instance, right? These uh, clumps that are very tiny in the Hubble uh, images, they are huge here. And also, with MUSE, you see more the diffuse ionized gas that collects all of that. So you see better this jellyfish structure when you don't have that good observation. So yeah, <laughs> I was talking to Jacopo the other day, I mean, high resolution, it sometimes just ruins the fun. <laughs> No, seriously, because the better resolution, the more things you have to model. And that's, uh, the, that's the bad thing. So as I said, we have these five uh, bands here. And uh, three of them we use for detection. So one UV filter, the narrow band in alpha, and a rather optical filter we also use for detection. And this is an example of the objects, the clumps that we detect in the uh, continuum subtracted H alpha images. And the color coding here is according to the region of the galaxy. <laughs> so the green ones are what we call tail. The orange ones are what we call disk. And in between, you have some clumps that we can see that they are extended, they, sh they are stripped, but they still overlap with the stellar disk and we call them extra planar. And what we are interested in this work are the tail and the extra planar clumps, so the stripped uh, clumps, the star formation in the tail, and more specifically so to things like this here, which is detected in all of the bands. And we want it to be detected in all bands to perform SD fitting. So we have uh, over 300 H alpha clumps, 800 something clumps detected in the ultraviolet. And these structures, these clumps detected in ultraviolet, at ultraviolet is F257Y and, uh, and HSV filters. And these clumps that are detected in H alpha and in the UV, they are embedded in larger structures that we call star forming complexes and we detect on the optical, we have around 300 of these. And note that we have uh, a piece PSF of uh, 70 parsecs, but we still don't consider all the objects as resolved. Some of them remain unresolved. And it's also important to note here that some of these objects are co-spatials. You have clumps inside clumps inside complexes. And we model the star formation histories of these objects as a delayed exponential. And we do some fancy prior settings just to make sure that we will get the most out of this model. So uh, from this model, we may get a single burst. So the duration of uh, star formation is controlled by a parameter called tau. So if this is very small, we get a single burst. We may get more extended star formation rate, uh, star formation history, or also a rise in star formation history with all this diversity. And we fit these uh, objects using bagpipes. So we have some examples 
of uh, H alpha and UV clump and uh, star forming complex. And these are the uh, fits to the SEDs. Here are the five bands that we use. And these are the main parameters that we're interested in. So it's ages, stellar masses, uh, star formation rates, and the obscuration by dust. And why, the reason why I uh, wanted to show the specifically the models that we use is that if you look at the distribution of the age over tau, you see that there, it's quite bimodal. So the fits that we get for our sample, they sometimes are very extended star formation histories, or sometimes they are single or <laughs> city. And of course, we are not able to pin down very uh, well the exact values, but there, there is this uh, diversity here. And if the code is doing something that you don't understand, the thing that you have to do is put yourself in the code's mindset. So what is the code fitting? It's fitting colors. So let's look at color, color diagrams. And here in the y-axis, I have a color that is actually like an H alpha equivalent width. So it's H alpha minus the underlying containing. And in the x-axis, it's a broadband color. So as you go to the right, you get redder colors. Um, and uh, what happens here is that you need these different values of tau to cover this whole diagram. Because if you have only simple stellar populations, you cannot have slightly redder uh, broadband colors without losing your H alpha. Because you lose your H alpha as soon as you're older than 10 million years. And this is something that's been on my mind because I have to explain this to the Rufib right now. Uh, now let's, uh, uh, the way this talk works is like, we start with the more boring things and we go slightly to the more interesting. Uh, so getting a little bit more interesting, let's go look at the properties that we retrieve. So the ages of uh, these objects are 27 mega years, more or less, for the um, uh, H alpha clumps. And the UV clumps and the complexes are basically 40 mega years. Now, it's interesting that the uh, H alpha clumps are not younger than 10 mega years, because 10 mega years is more or less the time scale of the H alpha emission. And this would tell us that there is some uh, underlying older population there. It's not pure H2 regions. The stellar max <laughs> range that we are growing is from 10 to the 3.5 to 7. So it's kind of in the global or cluster dwarf galaxy regime. And these uh, whole complexes, they are slightly more diffuse than the clumps in stellar mass surface density, but not by much. If you look at the star formation rates, the interesting thing here is that the H alpha clumps are not the most star forming uh, objects in the sample. The most star forming are the complexes that are detected in the optical, and that's so because these huge complexes, they may include one or more H alpha clumps inside them. So they uh, have lots of star forming regions inside them. And if you look at the uh, AV values, they're quite low. And you only have like significant dust in the extra planar region, which is here on the uh, right uh, hand side. And uh, when you're looking at the H alpha clumps. So it's probably either just from the disk or um, maybe it's, it means that this is not very efficiently strict. We will get uh, more about this later. And so we have masses, we have star formation rates. We should put them in the stellar mass star formation rate uh, relation. And this is for the H alpha clumps. You see that they are systematically above the relation that we find for galaxies. And we interpret this as due to this being the isolated star forming regions. And in galaxies, you are watering it down with non star forming regions. And it's interesting when you 
try to put the other objects like the uh, UV clumps and the star forming complexes in the relation of the H alpha clumps. Uh, you see that some of them are in the same relation as the H alpha clumps. So the gray band here, it's not a new fit, it's the same relation that I had for the H alpha. And other objects, they fall down. And this is because of those two types of star formation histories that I was uh, showing you before. So you see the boring parts are important. <laughs> now this, I ask you, yes, do you just call H alpha as the mm. filter or do you remove the contribution from the nitrogen to? Um, no, uh, I, I cannot remove the, um, the contribution from okay. the nitrogen to, I'm sorry. Yeah, because we don't have the data for that. So, um, it's the H alpha filter, but it does include the um, uh, N2. We use some um, like magic <laughs> to <laughs> subtract the, to correct for the contribution of N2 when we are calculating the H alpha luminosities. But for detection purposes, note that we only use the H alpha continuous subtracted image for uh, detection, then we uh, fit uh, the whole uh, flux of the filter. Uh, and for detection purposes, I don't think it's an issue to have N2 there. Well, what about, I, I, I ignore this subject, but what about if you have a low ionization structure that is nitrogen to bright in our H alpha count? We don't detect the low ionization <laughs> uh, sources. Uh, so, if you look at like the low surface brightness components that we see in Muse, and that's what we were uh, showing before, like, like in Muse, you see the clumps and you see also the diffuse component connecting them. Uh, we don't detect that with uh, HST. So, HST has much better resolution, but it's not an 8 meter telescope. So, to have this uh, sensitivity, to the very low surface brightness, it's not the, the best instrument. So yeah, basically we got lucky, we just don't have that. So you see the worst data, less things to worry about. It's, it's different. Okay, so uh, it starts becoming interesting when you plot these properties against the distance to the host galaxy. So this plot here is distance to the center of the galaxy. And uh, in the y-axis is the age of the clumps and the complexes. And the reason why I'm not showing this plot is because the first time that I have uh, made this plot, it, I was expecting a positive trend. So I was uh, thinking maybe you would also expect that, that as we move further away from the galaxy, we have like the objects that were stripped a longer time ago, and those should be older. That's what I was expecting. This is what I got. So it's like the opposite trend. So it's uh, and there is a lot of scatter, but the trend uh, is relatively, uh, I wouldn't say robust, but. Uh, it cannot be ignored. It's not consistent with uh, being flat. So why does that happen? Why are we finding younger objects further away from the galaxy? So the key to understand that is that the stars are not stripped. The stars are not removed. The gas is removed. And as you remove the gas and, and you start forming stars, as soon as you form stars, the stars are locked into there. They are not stripped further away. So you may keep forming stars there, uh, and you will age in that region. And in the meantime, you keep stripping gas, and you strip it far away, and eventually start forming stars again, far away from the galaxy. And this is why the younger regions are further away from the galaxy because the gas was stripped until then, and it just recently started forming stars. Uh, in a it stopped working. 
Okay, so similarly, we have a, a trend with uh, stellar mass. This can be understood as a consequence of the trend with age. So things that are further away from the galaxy are less massive because they are younger and have less time to form stars. Um, if you look at the star formation rate, there isn't much of a change. We also look at uh, like the frequency of objects that are uh, currently star forming or not star forming. So here is like the um, uh, histogram of the um, position of uh, objects that are not forming stars uh, and that are forming stars, like in the past 10 mega years. And there's, there isn't much of a difference in their position. So star formation rate is uh, quite sustained over the whole um, range. And again, when we look at this, we see large values of this attenuation only by, by the galaxies. And uh, for the complexes, there is a bunch of a trend. Uh, here for the VH output, uh, we, this is not exactly a trend, but it's like a triangle. So the trend that we see is uh, driven by the lack of objects here, right? And uh, this might mean that uh, dust is not as efficiently stripped from the galaxy, or that maybe we're just seeing this from the disk. Or as Jacopo suggested, that maybe as we move away, that dust might be destroyed by an interaction of the, the intercluster medium. So basically, clumps that are further away from the galaxy are less massive, younger, and less obscured by dust. Can I ask you a question yeah, about please. the trend yes, of yes. mass with distance? Yes. Can you say that it was because they were younger and they hadn't had time to form massive yeah. stars? It could be. It also could be that uh, it's just the leftover gas, the density is lower, and then you can form such uh, massive stars. Okay, that uh, also, but that would also, um, so I agree, but I think that that would also change the star formation rate, right? So if you have like a more massive uh, cloud initially, you would have a larger star formation rate from that cloud, right? Mm -hmm. And we do not see a change in star formation rate. So I'm not saying this is not the case. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this is not what the data is telling me, uh, although there are many uncertainties here and... Uh, but the thing is that these calculations of star formation we always assume, I mean, I haven't thought about it, mm -hmm. but it's going to work, no? mm -hmm. but they always assume a canonical alignment. Oh, yes, yes. But if the IMF actually changed, mm -hmm. then maybe one has to change the species of mm -hmm. calculating the star Yes. No, I totally agree. And changing the IMF in these models is basically impossible because it's degenerate with everything. So we, uh, if we had like spectra at very high resolution and could look at uh, like uh, specific indices that measure like the fraction of dwarfs or something, then you, you can do something with the IMF, but it's <laughs> very complicated. And if you look at the works that uh, have that, it's usually like considering single bursts of star formation. So you don't have all the degeneracies of the star formation history. So yeah, I agree, but I also, like there are only like very few ways that we could study the yeah, I understand, but just an mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, maybe one day we'll have a telescope that can measure this star by star and then we will know. But yeah, I, I totally agree that like the IMF here is a Krupa IMF because, right? Uh, because we have to assume something. Um, it's just changing not really the element, but the mm -hmm. upper limit of the element. Yes. It could be Kruger, it could mm -hmm. be Xavier, whatever. Yes. But you don't form very massive stars because your gas is getting, uh, you have very mm -hmm. few, very little gas mm -hmm. and the basic one. Yeah, and indeed that might be a problem for the star formation rates uh, that we derive because the 
the clubs that we have, they're usually like more massive than 10 to the 4. So it's not such a problem for uh, the IMF. Uh, but if you look at the star formation rate, which is the mass that was formed in the past 10 mega years, that's quite low. So that might have uh, some uh, some effects of the animal. <laughs> uh, so as I said, the, these trends with distance, we can uh, understand them as the gas keeps moving away and the stars stay put. If you look at this in the smaller scales, you can also see that like zooming into some of these star forming regions, that there is like an H alpha emitting um, part that is on the edge of, and this is not very well uh, visible in the projector, I'm sorry. But what we have is like extended regions with an H alpha emitting source in one end and uh, like a more like UV or optical tail. So this thing that you have like in the large scales, you also have like in the in the smaller scales, and we interpret that as being due to the as the gas is stripped, you also move the star forming region away and you leave behind a trail of all stars. Okay. Of course, we can see it in uh, things like this, you have an H alpha region here and a more extended uh, region that we find in the optical. So we want to see how this, uh, this extension, this uh, displacement of the H alpha region uh, evolves. And so I, I really like animations, you can see. So we find the H alpha clump, we find the center of the optical emission of this complex. And we find the distance between these two, and we call this clump displacement. So how far away the clump is from the beginning, uh, from the uh, center of the complex. And now I want to play a game with you. The name of the game is how many variables I can put in one plot. So here I plot this clump displacement against the difference in age between the complex and uh, and the uh, gun. So things that are up there, it means that the clump is very young with respect to the complex. Okay. And you can see that these things scale quite reasonably well. So wherever you have larger age differences, you have clumps that are more displaced. So basically you have like an older complex and structure that is more uh, evolved and you have this uh, larger displacement is a way to understand how this structure is growing in time. If, let's see, what, what variable do you want me to talk about now? Let's talk about the size of the, the points. The size of the points is the size of the complex. So also the ones that have this larger um, uh, larger age difference, larger displacement are the, the larger ones. And the power of the points is the fraction of the complex that does not have clumps. So the fraction that uh, of the area that is only like the older stars. So the, what you're seeing here is that the, the complexes age and you keep having star formation in a smaller and smaller part of the complex. And if you look at the squares here, they represent the most and the least elongated. So as you displace the age of a clump and get older, you also get more elongated. And uh, a caveat for this is that as the complex age, the, um, the clumps also get older. So it's not that the clump is uh, staying of the same age and uh, for any complex. So there is a skinny of that. And this probably means that 
there is like a mixing with the old population inside the clump. Uh, now we can play a fun game uh, since we have the stellar masses and the stellar mass surface densities. We can take these uh, star forming complexes and put in this diagram <laughs> of stellar mass and stellar mass surface density and compare them with other objects. So I'm comparing the uh, star forming complexes here with uh, a sample of uh, um, dwarf galaxies from the Fornox cluster, a sample of dwarf galaxies in the local uh, group, and I wanted to also include ultra compact dwarfs and um, globular clusters in this plot because they're also in the same mass range, but they are so far above that I had to take them out, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything in the the plot. So the line that you see here is the 5% percentile of the uh, stellar mass surface density of globular clusters. So they are much more denser than, much more dense that we want them to be, to be connected with these uh, galaxy pieces that we are seeing. Instead, we have a very good agreement with uh, dwarf galaxies. So it could be that if these uh, objects remain gravitation bound somehow, they could become dwarf galaxies. Now, would we be able to detect these things? Because they're quite faint, right? So with, if they become dwarf galaxies, would we be able to detect them in a cluster? I will do something now that you have to promise me you will never do, okay? So I will take the star formation histories that I calculated and I will extrapolate them into the future, <laughs> right? So never do that. Uh, and what I'm plotting here is uh, the R band magnitude of the complexes if I put them at the redshift of the Fornax cluster, right? <laughs> so this is the apparent magnitude. And I want to compare this uh, with the samples of uh, dwarf galaxies that we have for Fornax. And we are kind of, after three or six giga years, it doesn't change much, uh, the magnitude, and it's kind of in the faint end of what can be detected. So it could be that if these objects remain gravitationally bound, they would contribute to a sample, uh, to a population of dark matter free galaxies, uh, dwarf galaxies, very diffuse uh, dwarf galaxies in clusters. Um, I think that's it. And uh, just before I say I wrap it up, I would like to invite you to this conference that we're organizing in Pisa next year about the physical processes shaping galaxy evolution. It would be very nice to see some of you there. Uh, if you're interested, just uh, talk to me and uh, can point you to the registration website, registration, which is open until next week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so what effectively, like the result is that the things that are here are older than the things that are here, right? And uh, this has to do with uh, how different phases of uh, the gas in the galaxy are stripped. So as you start stripping the like less, uh, uh, less dense uh, phases of the interstellar medium, those will not form stars immediately, but the more de dense molecular gas that you have, it will probably form stars very near the galaxy. And you will have like these big clouds with a lot of fuel near the galaxy, and you will keep forming stars near the galaxy for a long time. And as soon as you start forming stars, you the uh, that region keeps the it's kind of locked into the velocity difference that is had with the galaxy. And also, like, it, some stars may even fall back in. This is something that people have seen in simulations, but very controversial. Uh, and in the meantime, you keep stripping that less dense gas. Uh, and as it mixes with the intercluster medium, it cools down and it forms new stars. So that's how you get, like, the younger... Uh, stars far away and the older stars uh, uh, close to the galaxy. So the, the older stars that are forming closer to the galaxy are the ones, the first gas that was stripped. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, I was very happy with your explanation, but then the, how come when you mix it with the cluster gas that is so hot, is it, it gets cold? Yeah, we also want to know that. So <laughs> Oh, uh, so what we know uh, is that there should probably be some mixing because if you look at the metallicities that we get, the gas phase metallicities that we get from the mu data, you get uh, lower metallicities far away from the galaxy. And like we know how to make more metals, but it's like to make it the gas more metal poor, you have to mix it with something else. Right? Uh, so this is where the, one of the places where the idea of mixing comes from. Uh, we also see that there should be some shocks uh, ionizing things and the simulations, the simulations speak very loudly about uh, mixing and cooling. So the exact physical mechanism that makes it cool when it uh, mixes with the hot gas, I don't know. <laughs> but maybe Jacopo. No, I don't know. Like but, but, so, there are, but there is one galaxy in particular where in the tails you be barely see any star formation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that's because it's a close to a, a X-ray spot. Mm -hmm. so what's An X-ray spot. And so probably that's where the the, the gas uh, is kept uh, hot and cannot put uh, mm -hmm. uh, down. So now that I, I realize then that this image of all the gas being very hot mm -hmm. is probably a simplification. And then you, you might have some very hot spots and other. Yes, so. there are. There yes. yes, also because like the gas is not being stripped like orderly. It's like a very chaotic thing that in some, you, maybe you may uh, decrease in entropy locally in some place while, uh, uh, and then you increase density uh, point that you can form stars. So, it's... Okay. I was put by the, by the low column density that we get. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, but, but keep this this in mind. Okay. So uh, I was wondering whether you are biased because you are using optical uh, emission, mm -hmm. and then you cannot detect a b or of of ten. I don't know. Uh, and yeah, the, the low column density that you have. Yes. I was puzzled why you have such a low column density mm -hmm. in star forming regions. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I will think is that uh, oh. maybe you are biased because you are mm -hmm. using optical, and then if you have an extinction of ten, you mm -hmm. won't see anything. No? Ah, okay. And whether and whether, for instance, in, in this in this slide, mm -hmm. in the middle panel, in the, in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, well, you, my impression is that you have like something diffuse becomes more brilliant and then dark. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this mm -hmm. is a typical trend. 
Yeah, it's a typical trend. So, so, so maybe the, 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 the more extinction is, is afterwards, and you are not, you cannot measure it because. Uh, so, it, we do not see a lot of evidence uh, for very uh, dark uh, thumbs, but it might be a case for very small lumps in extinction and therefore not being detectable. We are trying to submit a nature's KWST proposal to see that. So definitely there are biases there. Uh, now, also I want to point out that the things that they were putting in the plot and that have these uh, low um, surface densities, they are not just the, the clumps, but they are the region in the optical that is composed of many clumps. So this is the thing that we found that some of these clumps, they are embedded into larger regions. They are forming such structures. And then these whole structures, it want, it's what I am putting in the plot not the single clumps, which should indeed be uh, more, uh, yes, uh, should, should be um, more dense, right? Uh, the other thing is that I'm also only selecting the ones that are resolved. So the ones that are larger than two PSFs, so larger than 140 parsecs. So I'm just, I'm taking like, these are really like the largest structures that we uh, have there. And the idea is to see, okay, we have these large structures, like are these like, do these like resemble something that we know exists, like some larger objects? And uh, that's the goal of the book. Uh, well, yeah, let's see, let's see that like you said about the low circumstances. Mm -hmm. I had about the low extinction. Okay. So that, that maybe you were missing mm -hmm. the hair extensions. Okay. So use do it in the optical. That's always okay. So it's going to be so, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. Day. This is true. But um, if you look at uh, like other studies that with HST or uh, simulations, uh, it does seem that dust is not very efficiently spread. So you can see that there is sort of a detachment between the dust uh, and the, the galaxy, like a kinematical um, detachment, but it doesn't seem to be stripped. So all basically all the dust that you will see in the star formation regions, they would have to be formed in situ, right? Really? I, because because that would mean that's a hypothesis. Some, some, yeah, but that, that somehow will mean that mm -hmm. dust is not well mixed with the gas. And ISM people mm -hmm. always say that it's mm -hmm. very well mixed. So why in these cases because not the interaction mm -hmm. with uh, this gas component, which is not affecting very much the dust. There are proofs of, of this. For example, in the Virgo cluster, you see truncated dust disks only in those galaxies which are ex in the most extremely the H1 deficient galaxies. So when you have lots, lots of strip, then dust tends to be stripped again, but the run pressure must be very strong. Uh, so there could be some dust stripping in these galaxies, but uh, we should check what's the, the, the H1 deficiency, and probably it would be just the first phase of, of dust stripping. The, so the, the dust, the clumps, the, out, the most outgrowth clumps should not be very Galaxy dust, and I I'm getting like into imaginary territory here, okay? Yes. Uh, but yeah, the the dust is well mixed with the gas in the ISM, mm -hmm. but as you strip, this dust is uh, like susceptible to stripping in a very different way. So it might uh, it, you might separate this picture. But if, if it is true that the dust is formed in situ, then it makes sense that the younger population don't have enough dust because you don't mm -hmm. have enough time to form it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me ask any uh, questions on Zoom. I think there's no, <laughs> no more questions from the audience. Okay, if not, let's thank something.
And thank you for that. Thank you. 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 Thank